Hidden inside the darkest chapters of modern warfare is a chemical weapon whose name alone seems to taste strange, mustard gas. It sounds almost culinary, but what it really refers to is one of the most notorious chemical agents ever deployed on a battlefield. In this video, we'll break down exactly what mustard gas is, where it came from, how it evolved, how it works on the human body, and why its legacy still matters, historically and ethically. All that and more, right here on History of Simple Things. When chemists talk about mustard gas, they're referring to a class of chemical warfare agents, the most infamous of which is sulfur mustard, a compound that blisters skin and mucous membranes upon contact. Despite its name, mustard gas isn't a gas at room temperature. It's a thick, oily liquid that readily forms a vapor or fine mist when released. It smells faintly like garlic or mustard, hence the nickname. But its effects are anything but mild. Sulfur mustard belongs to a group called vesicants, named for the blisters, or vesicles, they produce on exposed skin. Mustard gas is not designed primarily to kill outright. Instead, it was engineered to incapacitate soldiers, causing painful burns, temporary or permanent blindness, and respiratory damage that could linger for years. Exposure doesn't always show immediate symptoms, sometimes taking hours before blistering begins, which made it bewildering and terrifying for troops trying to figure out whether they were exposed. The chemistry behind mustard gas predates its use in war. The compound was first synthesized in 1860 by British chemist Frederick Guthrie while experimenting with organosulfur compounds. Guthrie noted its toxic properties, a chilling hint of what was to come. But mustard gas didn't enter warfare until World War I. Chemical warfare itself emerged as armies struggled to break the brutal stalemate of trench warfare. Earlier gases like chlorine and phosgene had already been introduced by both sides in the conflict. But mustard gas debuted later and with a different effect. On July 12, 1917, German forces released mustard gas against British and Canadian troops near Ypres in Belgium. It was the first large-scale use of this agent in combat. The Germans called the mixture Yellow Cross after the color coded on artillery shells containing it. The French, who encountered it on the battlefield, named it Ypresite after Ypres. Compared with earlier choking or choking agents, Mustard gas was insidious, heavier than air. It would settle in the trenches, linger in soil for days or weeks, and contaminate clothing and equipment. It wasn't always immediately fatal, but it could permanently incapacitate soldiers long after exposure. At the molecular level, sulfur mustard is relatively simple, but its biological effects are devastating. When inhaled or when liquid droplets contact skin or eyes, it causes chemical burns that destroy tissue and disrupt normal cell function. It attacks the respiratory tract, stripping off the protective mucous membrane, and on the skin it produces painful blisters indistinguishable from severe burns. Eyes are especially vulnerable. Heavy exposure can lead to temporary or permanent blindness. In World War I, gas masks offered some protection against many agents, but mustard gas could seep into unprotected skin, clothing, and even unsealed protective gear. Soldiers would sometimes improvise by soaking cloths in urine to try and neutralize the agent, a testament to both desperation and the lack of understanding about these chemicals at the time. Although lethal in high doses, mustard gas was used more for its ability to incapacitate and demoralize. Once troops were exposed, they were often unable to fight effectively, blinded, burned, or gasping for breath. The use of mustard gas in World War I marked a turning point in the history of warfare. Chemical weapons inflicted hundreds of thousands of casualties, 
even if they accounted for a smaller percentage of deaths compared to conventional weapons. The sheer suffering they caused shocked the global conscience. After the war, the 1925 Geneva Protocol was drafted, explicitly banning the use of chemical and biological weapons in conflict. Though not perfect, it permitted production and stockpiling. It represented the first major international attempt to curb these horrors. Post-World War II, many nations continued research and stockpiling, but further treaties tightened controls. The Chemical Weapons Convention, which entered into force in 1997, went further by banning production, stockpiling, and use of chemical weapons, including mustard agents, and calling for the destruction of existing caches. The legacy of mustard gas remains paradoxical. Research into these chemicals and their effects eventually informed medical science, including early chemotherapy agents derived from mustard compounds. While these medicinal applications are far removed from their origins, they underscore the complexity of scientific advancement that can spring from even the darkest technologies. Mustard gas wasn't just chemistry. It was a tool designed to maximize human suffering. Its introduction into warfare forced humanity to confront a hard truth. Some technologies are so damaging that their very existence demands our ethical scrutiny. Today, the vast majority of the world recognizes chemical weapons as beyond the pale. Their production, use, and storage are prohibited under international law. That's not because wars suddenly became polite, it's because we learned painfully where the line must be drawn to preserve some measure of humanity in conflict. The suffering caused by mustard gas in World War I and in other conflicts where it was later used wasn't a side effect. It was inherent to its design. Victims often endured weeks of agony. Symptoms could take hours to appear, giving soldiers no immediate indication of exposure. Some never fully recovered. So when we talk about mustard gas today, we're not just discussing a historical oddity. We're talking about a lesson in responsibility. Science can create profound power, but without ethical guardrails, power without restraint becomes brutality. Thank you for watching. If you have suggestions for our next video, feel free to share them in the comments below. We'll be sure to give you an acknowledgement for your contribution. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other bingeable channels. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the history of simple things. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more stories woven through the smallest details.